It's a great privilege to open this first panel session of our Legacy Conference, 17 years on from the establishment of the court. Just think back then, those of you who are old enough, to the feelings of frustration, of impotence in those days as we watched on CNN the Sliverwich swigging Serb mortar crews pumping shells down into the ancient city of Dubrovnik, raking with firepower, citizens going about there to market in Sarajevo, executing patients at Vukovar Hospital. Barbarism was on the march again in Europe, and the great powers, the United Nations and the EU were powerless to stop it. In those days, they told that hopeless black joke, what do you do with a man who kills another man when you put him in prison for life? What do you do with a man who kills 20 people? You send them to a mental asylum until he's cured. What do you do with a man who kills 200,000 people? Ah, oh, you send him to a luxury hotel in Geneva for peace negotiations. That was the black joke about Milosevic that got even blacker. And the court which came into being in 1993, well, the legacy that it was hoped it would deliver on was that in Nuremberg, 50 years later, without a death penalty and with a right of appeal. Ah, Nuremberg, all those well-behaved defendants who always obeyed the judges. The newsreel, black and white, of Hermann Goering coming up to the microphone with a great sheaf of notes to make a speech. Jeffrey Lawrence, the judge, saying, Herr Goering, you are, this is not the time for speeches. You must plead either guilty or not guilty. Well, he dropped his notes. It was literally collapse of start party. Uh, he pleaded not guilty and went back to the, uh, his place in the dock. Well, nostalgia now. No trouble at Nuremberg in getting evidence. All the documents were available, as Justice Jackson, the prosecutor, said. Nuremberg succeeded because of the Teutonic habit of writing everything down. They had Goering's signature on the night and fog decrees and so forth. Uh, but in, so in 1993, another Nuremberg tribunal, uh, carrying on Nuremberg's legacy, uh, seemed a, a good public relations idea to the diplomats who supported it in public, although in secret thought it would never achieve anything. Uh, it would, for some of its supporters in those days, thought it would uh, be like the Nuremberg legacy, as Germany has, uh, has shown. But that optimism soon proved something of an eye disease. Many uh, started to, diplomats would anonymously write articles saying, oh, it will, the judges will get in our way. It will stop us from uh, arranging for tyrants to leave the bloody stage with the amnesty in the back pocket and the Swiss bank account intact. It will get in our way. Dr. Kissinger, <laughs> not anonymously, he uh, said these judges uh, have no idea of real politik. But, uh, and in the meantime, for some years, uh, the only defendant in the court was Mr. Tadic, that freelance torturer who lent his name to the court's early jurisprudence. And we all remember the NATO spokesman who said, arresting Karadic is not worth the blood of one NATO soldier. That was in 1998, and even in 2000, as late as 2000, when Carla Del Ponte told uh, CIA Director George Tenet, uh, I really think the CIA should help the hunt for Mladic. He replied, Madam Prosecutor, I don't give a shit about what you think. Well, at least that's what Carla said. Uh, <laughs> George, George Tenet said with a, uh, but after that, things could only get better, and they did with the arrest of Milosevic, the gradual processing of 160 defendants. By the time Karadzic was finally arrested, most of the media had swung in support. The ICTY had become something of a success story, and its work in ending impunity and pioneering international judges, justice had won substantial support, at least in Europe, where it was hailed as a 
harbinger of a shift from expediency to legality in world affairs. But what counts as success? Nuremberg was successful, although it was victor's justice, because victory had brought the power to do justice to those who deserved it. Uh, the legacy, of course, of Nuremberg was that Germany itself took over uh, and still continues in the Demaniuk trial. Uh, the uh, legacy uh, gained the confidence and the determination to put its own people behind bars. Uh, and of course, uh, that is one legacy that the ICTY uh, must itself achieve in the countries of ex Yugoslavia. The ultimate legacy, I suppose, will be in 50 years' time if there are ICTY-based museums in Belgrade and Zagreb commemorating its work when national courts in those countries develop a record of convicting their own nationals for war crimes. It will be a success if they still remember in 50 years' time Srebrenica if they still play the Scorpions video on the History Channel, that will be the legacy, certainly, of the ICTY. But, of course, the real legacy at, at the moment is a tribunal that's robust enough to acquit, if there is a reasonable doubt, to get at the truth while sitting far away from the scene of the crime, uh, to provide a fair trial, notwithstanding the popular prejudice against defendants. But in terms of legacy, the failures, too, must be handed on with some suggestions for overcoming them in the future. The first failure, of course, as you know, is the enormous cost uh, of the proceedings. The second failure is the inordinate delay, a delay that was intolerable uh, in the Milosevic trial for four years, uh, and they barely started the defense. Uh, and the problem, of course, that hasn't been solved of what to do about the truculent, disobedient, self-defendant. A legacy vision uh, today must be confident but can't be complacent. And we're going to discuss that vision now with our panel uh, for a little while, and then I'll throw the questions open to you uh, with our roving microphones, and uh, you can ask your questions to the panel, uh, and we have uh, a panel of seven men in suits, the sort of panel that would not be allowed on the BBC and would not be allowed on the United Nations Administrative Tribunal, where there must be gender balance. Uh, I suppose, President Robinson, uh, you selected these seven men in order to give an idea of what courts were like back in 1993. <laughs> Is it too early, I wonder, to have a legacy <coughs> statement? You're not finished. Your best is yet to come. You've got Karadic, you may get Miladic soon. Is it too early to think of legacy? Am I on? Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator, uh, for the introduction. Um, in defense, I might say that we do have um, uh, several female judges in the tribunal. <clears throat> uh, it's not too early to speak of legacy. Uh, the tribunal has been in existence now for, for 17 years. You know. And in 2003, we started transferring cases to the national jurisdictions and we also started uh, capacity building uh, to assist those jurisdictions in, in those trials. Uh, those jurisdictions um, need to be able to scrutinize the tribunal's work, to make an assessment of it, and to translate it, to put it into practice in their national context. What's your legacy vision at this stage? The, 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 the vision legacy thing? vision, I would say, is, is one of national ownership. And by national ownership, 
I don't mean simply uh, transferring uh, knowledge to the region and assisting courts. I mean, in fact, the recognition that it will be up to the post-conflict societies to take charge of, the just, of their justice systems and to um, ensure a lasting peace. Um, it's interesting that um, one of the eight principles set by the Secretary General in his policy for the rule of law is ensuring national ownership. Yes, external assistance uh, can be helpful, but ultimately it will be up to the domestic jurisdictions to, to pioneer a path uh, for themselves. Ownership implies the legal ability to discard, to throw out, not to pursue. Uh, we remember Victor's justice at Nuremberg. We don't remember losers' justice, the Leipzig tribunals after the First World War, where 95% were acquitted, or, and those who were convicted were allowed to escape. Uh, and surely, how are you going to ensure that in a country like Serbia, where 70% of the people on the latest poll uh, don't like the ICTY, how are you going to ensure, or try to ensure, that uh, those countries actually prosecute their own war criminals? I think the best we can do is um, by the example that we have set here of, of fair trials. Uh, we ensure that any accused person tried at the tribunal is given a fair and expeditious trial. And I should also mention that in our legacy strategy, we are placing emphasis on transparency so that countries of the former Yugoslavia will be able to build on our success. They will also be able to profit from the, the failures. And they have been failures. You have, you have referred to some of them. But we can't ensure that um, Serbia will try uh, the um, <clears throat> accused persons. We can only set an example here and hope that we'll, it will be followed. And the example is one of fair trial. You know? An example of fairness carrying over, say, into Serbia, Tomislav Vishnic, uh, thank you very much for stepping in at the last moment when uh, the president of your association was taken ill last night. Uh, tell us, do you see that as a possibility in the future in Serbia, that the legacy will be seen as one of fair trial? At this stage, it is... Serbia. At this stage, it is a very uh, difficult and uh, thankless uh, uh, forecast what would uh, be of assistance, for, at least in the view of us uh, attorneys at law, and what would uh, uh, provide one of the elements which have to be present in any fair uh, trial is the role of uh, defense in uh, the conduct of these trials in that it uh, should be organized in an institutional manner. It should be part of the system, uh, just as it was part of the system here in the ICTY, it should be part of uh, the trials that will be conducted in the region. In that context, we can uh, uh, boast with one positive example.